This morning we established from our devotional reading and the context, of course, of this sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians that it was possible for these brethren at Corinth to know certain things. We know that to be the case because Paul keeps bringing to their attention something they did know, they could know, they should know. And the things that they could and should know should have a direct bearing on the things that they did. You know, sometimes we'll even say, those that know better do better. And yet we know that even with our own personal selves, that's not often the case. Just because we know better doesn't mean necessarily that we do better. But one thing's for sure that if we don't know better, then how are we going to do better? And if we do, it's just a coincidence that we would happen to do that which is right. Well, here Paul is dealing with matters that pertain to their living the Christian life in the first century in the midst of an ungodly world, and specifically in a city that we noted uh, this morning was 10 times worse than San Francisco. That is the city of Corinth, and that's, of course, just something man made that idea up, and I think it pretty well stands on its own. When you do a little bit of historical research of the city of Corinth, that they could do better and should do better if they were going to be the influence they ought to be in the first century and specifically in a city like Corinth. We noted that this all fits into the category of the matter of choices. Everything that we do, every choice that we make has consequences. All the warnings that the Bible sets forth relative to making wrong choices should spur us on to make right choices. All the blessings that go along with making the right choices should encourage us to make those right choices. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. Of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of knowledge good and evil in the midst of the garden, don't eat it, the day you do, you die. Therefore, conclusion should be obvious that Eve would pay attention to God, who had never lied to her before, gave him a wonderful place to live, gave her a good husband by the name of Adam, but she listened to the devil and sinned against God. She thus suffered the consequences along with her husband who followed her lead. They were out of whack in what was supposed to be happening. He's supposed to be the leader, and she's supposed to follow him, but she's the leader, and he's following her. That's the problem. And the problem was, of course, that they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They suffered separation from God because of sin, and they then were separated from the tree of life and thus began to die physically. Two deaths experienced because of this one sin, spiritual death as well as physical death raining down upon the human race. But that's not the only time. Of course, we have the example of that throughout the Old Testament. The children of Israel, as they were going into the land of Canaan, set before them was clearly a blessing and a curse. They had the opportunity to choose which one it would be. At the end of the life of Joshua, he said, Choose you this day whom you'll serve. Me and my house will serve the Lord. They had the ability to choose. They could look at their history. They could look at what their forefathers had done when they were living down there in Egypt. And they could follow the gods of the Egyptians. They could follow the gods of the Amorites. Or they could follow the God of heaven. And if they followed the God of heaven, they'd be blessed. If they followed any of those other gods, they'd be cursed. Simple as that. And, of course, Jesus echoes those thoughts throughout his personal ministry. Clear-cut, black-and-white examples. Hear what God says and do it, you're a wise man. Hear what God says and don't do it, you're a foolish man. And your house will fall flat. Not talking about the building of a physical structure, but the life that a person constructs that's based upon what God said is a house, is a life that will stand even in the midst of terrible storms of life. And storms will come, of course. And other examples like that we looked at too, but I won't spend too much time there. We have to make a choice. We have to make a choice. We cannot serve God mammon. And those that do not serve the Lord are, in fact, by default, serving the opposite of mammon. Now, we noted this passage, and we put this in, in uh, along with Paul's affirmation of himself in uh, Romans chapter 7. And we observed that not only Paul, but also other New Testament writers had this concept of the war that was raging within them. A war between the flesh and the spirit. A war that somebody's going to win. Who's going to win it? You know, is it going to be the flesh that wins out over the spirit or the spirit that wins out over the flesh? Who decides that? Did God from all eternity choose certain ones to be victorious and other ones to not be victorious? That's not got anything to do with it. We individually have the prerogative as to choose as to whether we're victorious or whether we are losers. 
John says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for a seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now, what does that mean? If we take that passage and we put it in conjunction with what Paul had said, here's the two points I want us to see clearly. It's a matter of determination, not a matter of inability. It's not that a person, once he obeys the gospel, is in a position now where he cannot sin, but the faithful child of God has the attitude or determination that he does not want to sin. That's choice. That's free moral agency. The faithful child of God desires not to live a life of sin. An unfaithful child of God doesn't care. You know, A person in the world that lives for self is not concerned about the spiritual things of life. And that's, of course, by determination. And we explain a little bit further here, and this might uh, make more, uh, more of an impact. The faithful child of God will allow the spiritual man to reign supreme and thus will be so determined, there's that word determined, talking about determination, to stand against that which separates him from God that is simply unthinkable to commit such an atrocious lie, uh, act. In other words, you know, taken from uh, uh, Nancy Reagan a few years ago, just say no and mean it, you know. Don't just verbalize it, but actually mean it. Have the determination that this I will not do. We have a number of examples of individuals in the Bible who had that mentality. How about Joseph? How can I do this terrible thing and sin against God? Mrs. Potiphar, you know, well, I can't. He determined that he was not going to sin against his master. He wasn't going to sin against himself. He wasn't going to sin against God. He wasn't going to sin against the woman. He made that determination. And he did that because he could make that determination he had the power of choice and even so do we and that finds significant application realizing where Paul is writing the epistle that he does to the church at Rome it's in the midst of a terribly wicked city for sure so much so that here's Paul's attitude as he finds himself in this city the Lord had to speak to him in the night and tell him don't be afraid well, why would the Lord have to tell Paul, don't be afraid? Is there a possibility maybe that Paul would have been afraid? If not, then why would the Lord tell him not to be afraid? Would the Lord waste his time telling him to do something he would, was not feeling? I don't think so. Well, why would Paul have the tendency to be fearful in the city of Corinth? Because it was so wicked. That's why. Because it was so ungodly. And he had escaped with his life already in a number of different situations. And maybe he thought it was building up to the point where this is one time he's not going to escape with his life. But the Lord says, yes, you are. Don't worry. I'm with you. Nobody's going to kill you. Preach the truth. And don't worry about somebody killing you. Don't worry about somebody physically harming you. It's not going to happen. Now, with that assurance, then, of course, Paul preaches the gospel to a city that needed to hear the gospel, just like any wicked city needs to hear the gospel. And in that culture, of course, when a person had the audacity to live like a Corinthian, that meant they live a life of wastefulness and immorality. That was synonymous with it. In this sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians, we see a list of sins in which Paul catalogs these sins that will cause a person to not inherit the kingdom of heaven, not be able to inherit the kingdom of God. And I want us to look at these because they have a direct bearing on the end of this chapter, which, of course, is the focus of our devotion a few minutes ago. Notice how it begins. I'm sorry. Know ye not. There's, there's that phrase again. Know ye not. Here he is. Paul saying, here's something you already know. Here's something that you should have put to memory. Here's something that should be back there in your mind somewhere to the point where it comes forward every now and then you think about it. There are certain characteristics of sinful people and lifestyles that are so opposed to Christianity that nobody claiming to be a child of God should get anywhere close to it. And he lists some of those right here. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind. Somebody looks at that and says, well, you know, uh, it looks like most of those words there, except one, have to do with illicit sexual activity. That's right. Well, how did idolatry get in there? I mean, why 
would you find something like idolatry mixed in with all these sexual perversions or sins? It's because idolatry was part and parcel with that mentality that existed in places like Corinth because idolatry went right along with the illicit sexual relationship and sometimes even with gluttony and the eating of large meals that fit right into the category of worship of the God of so-called love. Yes, friends, idolatry was right in the midst of these terrible sins of a sexual nature. Interestingly, and some of our uh, more recent translations are more specific in defining what we're talking about when we're talking about the words here that's defined or is uh, translated in the King James as effeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind. The word effeminate in reality means soft. It would be the passive partner in a homosexual relationship. And that's about as, as clear as I want to make it. Soft. You remember that same term is used on one occasion when Jesus is saying to those who did not uh, appreciate John the Immerser as he preached amongst them. He even went so far as to ask the question, did you expect to find somebody soft when you came out to hear John? Did you really expect to see somebody that was sort of sissified when you went out? Well, that wasn't John, was it? No. You didn't have somebody in, in a nice, soft attire. And, and, uh, and the, I mean, can you really even think about that concept and not think of Elton John and Liberace? It goes right along with it. Soft attire. We know what it is. And so did the Holy Spirit in the first century context of Corinth. Not just Corinth, but specifically in the city of Corinth where these things were so rampantly engaged in. And, of course, abuse of themselves and mankind. In some translations, that word just plain old sodomites. Sodomite. So here in this very first verse in which we see some sins that will cause a person to be lost eternally and not be able to inherit the kingdom of heaven are sexual perverse sins. Isn't that interesting? That at the end of this chapter... Paul goes so far as to say flee fornication. Reckon how that fits in there. Has it always been the case that a failure to recognize the propriety of the sexual relationship has been evidence of people being separated from the will of Almighty God? Yes. Yes. One word answer for sure. All the way down through history. Remember in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. When here were the sons of men who saw the daughters, the, the sons of God who saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives, and then the next thing we find out is God says, I'm going to destroy the world. Well, what was the problem there? Here was someone that was attracted not because of a God-fearing woman they saw, but by the appearance of the woman and the desire to have them as a partner. That was the problem. And thus sin entered the world because of this wrongheadedness and false motivation for a spouse. Same principle holds true. When, remember when the children of Israel were going into the land of Canaan. They were forbidden from intermarrying with the heathen of the land. Well, why were they forbidden from he, uh, marrying the heathen of the land? Because the heathen of the land were doing the very things that were typical of Corinth of all things. The sins of the Gentile were pervasive in the land of Canaan. And... When they got over there into Canaan, you know, and they got to looking across the fence at those heathen girls, they looked a whole lot better than them old Israelite girls, so they married them. And the Israelite girls got to look at those hunk of hunk of boys that were heathens in the land, and they married them too. And it didn't take very many generations till the northern kingdom was carried into captivity by Assyria, and the southern kingdom was carried into captivity by Babylon because of their failure to be distinct and separate from the heathen of the land. Is that principle violated today all the time with just as disastrous of results today as there was disastrous results then? The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now he continues in the next page or next verses. Notice, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, nor shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then notice what he says. And such were some of you. Now wait a minute. 
You mean among the brethren at Corinth, those who were the recipients of this epistle, some of them had been engaged in the very sins that would cause a person to miss out on the kingdom of heaven? Well, that's exactly what Paul said. Well, what had taken place? Well, he even explains that in detail as we continue. They had been that way, but now they were washed. Now they were sanctified. Now they were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Something had taken place that did not pass a wand over those things and say, well, that's all right as long as you keep on engaging this heathen activity because now you're a Christian and that's all wiped clean. That's not what Paul says. Paul says they ceased and desisted from participating in those sins that would cause them to be lost and not inherit a home in heaven one day. They stopped. They stopped. And in their stopping of repentance, then they ended up enjoying the forgiveness of their sins, being washed, being justified, being sanctified by, by the Lord. Something significant had taken place. Well, what was it? Well, here is the whole point. They were now different than they once were. You know. What they were now is different than they were when they first heard the gospel. Can we not honestly say that that shouldn't describe each and every one of us that's a child of God this evening? Well, sure. We're not the same people we once were. Thank the Lord. Praise God. We're different. We're different than we were back then. We were hell bound right back then. Now we're heaven bound. We served the God of this world back then. We serve the God of heaven now. We were open to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life back then. Now we're open and receptive to the will of God. There's a tremendous change that's taken place just as it had taken place in the lives of these Corinthians. But just as now, the Corinthian brethren still lived in Corinth. And we still live in Dunlap or Saudi or Pikeville. Or we still live in a world that is given over to sin. And the pull of the world and its entanglements is constantly there trying to pull us back in there. Here's a way that Paul describes the Ephesian brethren, which, of course, describes everyone who has come out of that lifestyle of uh, maybe the rich and the famous, but a life that was doomed and damned in times past. Paul says, and you have he quickened. Now, the word quicken here simply means made alive. Here were individuals who needed to be made alive. Somebody said, well, were they dead? Yeah, they was dead spiritually. To you that have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world. I mean, you lived like the world did. You followed the desires of the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the mind. You did what the devil wants you to do. But now you've been made alive in Christ. And that same attitude, that same disposition works even till this hour in those that are described here as Paul, by Paul as being those who are open and receptive to the spirit of disobedience. Those that refuse to follow divine guidance and instead follow the desires of their mind. Even by nature, the children of wrath even as others. That describes them prior to the conversion. They, in times past, were doomed. They, in times past, were without hope. They were without God. They were without the blood of Jesus Christ in their lives. That's a pretty significant background, isn't it? But now they're washed. These Ephesian brethren, just as brethren Corinth, they're washed, they're sanctified, they're justified. I reckon what that has reference to Reckon where the dividing line exists between that life back there and then the life of a Christian. Well, think about Paul in Romans chapter 6. We mentioned that this morning as Paul makes a significant argument relative to the fact that God's grace does not extend to those who in rebellion continue to practice sin, even though some would say, let us sin to the high heaven so that God's grace will be made wonderful and more beautiful for all to see. That's not the case. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be so. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer with our hand? That's a pretty good question. Why would anybody think that they could continue to live in sin if they are dead to sin? 
Something's wrong with their thinking. If someone's dead to sin, they're not going to keep on living in sin. And the point at which that changed, of course, was when Paul says, as he includes himself in the number, in verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us, you mean, Paul, you're putting yourself in that same category of people? Absolutely. As many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in unison of life. Does that remind you of anything that maybe Paul did that's recorded in the book of Acts? How about when Ananias came to him and said, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Call on the name of the Lord. Is that what Saul of Tars- Tarsus did? Sure. Was he baptized into Christ and enjoying the forgiveness? Does he rise from the water of grave of baptism to walk in the use of life? Well, he includes himself in the number. Is there any other way to be washed, sanctified, justified? There ain't no other way. That's it. See? Remember in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul, also the writer, beginning about verse 25, says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word. What's he talking about? Washing of water by the word. That sounds like, except a man be born of water and of the spirit. Sounds like to me. The spirit's sword is the word which directs us to be baptized into the death of Christ where his blood was shed so that we can rise. To walk in the unison of life, enjoying the forgiveness of sin. You know, that worked for Paul. That worked for those in the death of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Paul references that in Ephesians chapter 5. Paul also references that in Ephesians, or, uh, Titus chapter 3 at verse 5. Washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. Paul mentioned 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. It is the Spirit's direction that causes us to be baptized in water for the remission of our sins. That's not just one way to see it. That's the only way to see it. It's the correct way to see it. That's how these Corinthians had gone from being lost, doomed, and damned to saved and on the high road to glory. That's the only way that the church at Ephesus had gone through that same position. That's the only way anybody at Dunlap has ever gone through that same process. Exact same way. And so Paul will say here in Ephesians, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, ye are not your own. Now that's just another way of saying, like he said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 2, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not my own. It's not my will that I do. But it's the Father's will that I am submitted to. I do the Father's will. Which is, of course, what Jesus demonstrated with his here. He came not to do his own will, but the will of the Father that sent him. We are not our own, Paul says. We've been bought, paid for, with a tremendous price. And that tremendous price, of course, is the shed blood of the perfect, sinless Son of God. And then we find a word that we make note of from time to time because it, the significance attached to it. There's a therefore. And when you see the word therefore, you're supposed to ask, what's it there for? Here, Paul is drawing an obvious conclusion. Based upon what he said previous, and of course it's going to be compounded by what he says later, but as a conclusion here, here's the logical end of the argument. Since you have been bought with a price... Since that price that was paid was the blood of Jesus Christ in your behalf. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Friends, the reason why he says therefore is that's the only reasonable conclusion that can be drawn from it. Here's something that's so obvious that, as some people would say today, it's one of those, duh, obviously. I mean, what else do you expect? Since you've been bought with a price then these things that characterize a sin-cursed world should not characterize one that claims to be a child of God. And if one claiming to be a child of God is eat up with that type of mentality, then something's terribly wrong. Christ is not being exhibited in the life of that person. There's a contradiction. The obvious conclusion is, is to live 
in such a way as to bring honor and glory unto God. This is the same principle as we read in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. See, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto, you, unto God, which is your reasonable service. It makes sense. It's simply the obvious conclusion made necessary by the evidence. Since God loved me when there was nothing loving in me and gave his son to die for me, the least that I can do is offer my body as a living sacrifice to him and demonstrate by my life my determination to do his will so that heaven one day might be my turn. It makes sense. And honestly, friends and brethren, nothing else does. Nothing else does. Now, obviously, when a person has a misunderstanding of the very nature of God, if someone is bought into one aspect of Calvinism or even multiple aspects of Calvinism, they're going to have a hard time putting all this into sense because it doesn't make sense from the God of Calvinism. But the God of the Bible, who created man with the ability to choose, it simply makes good sense. Common sense, Bible sense, and that's the sense that we must have, friends. You're not young. That could be. But our audience this evening, that cannot be rightfully said of you. Because if you've not yet obeyed the gospel, the Lord's not going to say you're not your own. Because you've not yet chosen to take advantage of the means whereby that can be said truthfully of you. You've been blessed with an opportunity tonight that you can obey God's simple plan of salvation. Hearing, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Believe in what you hear, inclusive of the fact that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. Being willing to repent of your sins, to confess the name of Christ, then you tonight can be baptized into the death of Christ where his blood was shed, the Lord adding you at the same time to his church. Pretty simple plan. A plan that's so simple that every single solitary accountable human being can understand it and obey it and know that they have. Are you such a person? Be faithful, and heaven will be your eternal home. If you're subject to heaven's invitation in any way, let us know how we can assist you. While together we stand and while we sing.